countries who do trade with North Korea. And by that, we know that he really means China because China, um, because North Korean trade, 80% of it is made up of trade with China, with smaller players like uh, India, Thailand, Russia, and the Philippines making up the rest. Now, uh, that's reigniting concerns of a trade war with China plus those other countries, which of course would be disastrous for equity markets. Now, it has to be said that investors are qualifying these jitters with the probability that it will happen. Uh, namely, uh, they don't think that it is that probable. They think that especially Trump security advisors will do their part in reining them in. We haven't seen any fire and fury tweets come out of Trump, so perhaps that strategy is even working. So really what markets have priced in for now is, um, is for perhaps a ratcheting up of uh, trade sanctions, but nobody, uh, nobody really seems to be pricing in the potential for an all-out conflict. They've also learned that assuming the worst when it comes to North Korea isn't the most profitable trade strategy. They've panicked before only to not see the situation deteriorate, so thus the anxiety was unwarranted and unhelpful for their trading in any case. In terms of knee-jerk reactions, though, I have to say this really isn't fading as fast as I thought it would, but it, I think we will see it eventually do so. Now, another headline today is leaders of BRICS uh, meeting in China, discussing economic models and ties uh, with the rest of the world. And they are looking at the EU. Do you think the European Union should be copied, really? You know, that's a really interesting question and one that I thought of quite a lot, especially with regard to the Brexit. We're starting to see how difficult it actually is to replace a, a single market and a customs union. And that really has gone a long way in terms of improving fortunes within the EU. But of course, if you're going to look at the EU as a model, you're going to have to look at its flaws. And I think that's where something like the Roderick's trilemma of globalization would come in handy. You have um, you have these three corners. You have uh, on, on the one hand, you have uh, high for globalization, national sovereignty, and democracy. And the, the compromises, of course, you'll probably just get two out of three. And that's where we are in the EU. And we've seen actually populism rise as a result of this perceived lack of national sovereignty within a supranational structure like the EU. So if the BRICS countries were going to adopt it as a model, they might figure out first how that is to be dealt with. Looking at the BRICS countries themselves, I have to say that perhaps adopting a similar model might be even more difficult for them because of uh, just because of how it's made up BRICS is basically um, a constellation where China dominates what you have is China and the others basically economically speaking and uh, they bought they also run uh, into each other quite a bit in terms of business with third countries so you have uh, the likes of South Africa uh, India and China competing for economic influence uh, within markets within African markets, for example, and that makes uh, cooperation across key sectors like, like technology, like R&D, quite difficult. And uh, not to mention the diverse cultures, I would argue that uh, BRICS countries are even further apart than uh, arguably European uh, continental countries are. So that is something that they would have to deal with if they were to adopt the EU model. I think it might be wiser for them to find something that works for them as a bloc specifically. Right, we'll sure keep a tab on that uh, meeting and see what decision they eventually come up with. Now, it's a slew of interest rates decisions uh, starting tomorrow with Australia and, uh, of course, later the ECB and the US FOMC. What are markets outlook on some of the headline decisions on tap? Well, the Reserve Bank of Australia is set to leave interests interest rates unchanged. Uh, it's, of course, at a record low of 1.5%, and it's doing that as it sort of waits on the housing market to gradually slow down while it waits for economic growth to pick up. Uh, over here um, in our very own Frankfurt, we have the European Central Bank meeting on Thursday, and their president, Mario Draghi, is widely expected to say something about the strength of the euro and how it could potentially be a affecting inflation and exports, but he's wi widely expected to say nothing uh, when it comes to the future of quantitative easing. So he's expected to hang fire on that. Now, on the other side of the Atlantic, we ha also have um, key members of the Federal Reserve speaking, New York Fed President Dudley and um, Dallas Fed President Robert Kaplan. They're both pretty skeptical about the need for another rate hike in the U.S. this year, and that's in contrast to Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester, who will also be 
speaking, and who has, uh, for her part, pleaded for a gradual tightening despite tepid inflation. So really, what we're having there is a mixed picture when it comes to the world central banks and an interesting week indeed. Right, thank you very much, Janelle. It's a new week, and we look forward to a beautiful one. Enjoy the rest of the day. We move on now to the U.S., where markets are closed today for Labor Day holiday. However, stocks closed higher on Friday as Wall Street assessed the likelihood of tighter monetary policy following a weaker-than-expected jobs report. The Dow Jones Industrial Average rose 39.49 points, with Goldman Sachs contributing the most gains. The index also rose above 22,000 earlier in the session for the first time since mid-August. The S&P 500 gained 0.17%. The Nasdaq Composite rose 0.1% to 6,435.33, a record close. For the week, the three major indices posted solid weekly gains. The Dow gained 0.8% for the week, while the S&P rose 1.3%. The Nasdaq, meanwhile, rose 2.7%, notching its best weekly performance of the year. In Asia, the markets there closed down today after North Korea said it tested a hydrogen bomb over the weekend. Stocks were further pressured on headlines that the North was planning future missile launches. The Kospi fell 1.19%. South Korean markets have uh, retraced losses fairly quickly in the past following North Korean saber rattling, but the benchmark index has taken slightly longer to recover after the latest provocations. Japan's Nikkei 225 declined 0.93%. The Australian ASX 200 slid 0.39% to finish at 5,702, with declines seen across most sectors. Greater China stocks were mixed, with mainland markets shrugging up geopolitical tensions in the region. Hong Kong's Hansen index slipped 0.9%. On the mainland, the Shanghai Composite rose 0.38% and the Shenzhen Composite climbed 0.602%. And um, we take a break now when we return. Mining giant Acacia reduces operations in Tanzania. Details in the <laughs>